A very good afternoon to all our esteemed faculties and our lovely delegates. I want to extend a very warm welcome to all of you on the second day of the second edition of the Manipal Urogynecology Conference. I hope we shall be able to maintain the same energy and the same enthusiasm with which we all had joined yesterday. And I will be able to guide you through this evening with the same charm as Dr. Surati did yesterday. So, this year has rather been in contrast to the years before, mainly because of this pandemic that we are grappling with. But even this gloomy time has the silver lining that we have the technical acuity to bridge over it. It is because of the same acuity that we are able to relish this exemplary session sitting in our comfort zones today. We would also love if all our delegates joined today could explore and enjoy our very own YouTube channel, Manipal Urogynecology, as introduced by Dr. Deeksha yesterday. Our YouTube channel is where you would find the minds of Mug, unraveling the secrets of the pelvic floor medicine for you. Also, we would want you all to look out into the portals of our Zoom lobby with corners like Selfie Corner, section to look out for our proficient faculties and loads of other interesting activities to do. So please do explore these portals. Now, after an invigorating prologue yesterday, we are all set to learn the practical aspects associated with the management of pelvic organ prolapse. Our session today is a live workshop on near human surgical training models to give our audience a real life experience of how surgeries pertaining to pelvic, pro pelvic organ prolapse are done. The speaker for today is none other than Dr. Douglas Miyazaki, the urogynecologist who has been practicing with a dash of innovation. In the present era, the role of research is imminent to combat fallacies of our management techniques and approach. However, a lot of the practitioners are unable to do this pertaining to monetary as well as technical restraints. But our faculty today, Dr. Miyazaki, has been successfully been able to overcome these challenges, which is in front of us in the form of this innovative session today. The training for the day shall be covering or rather uncovering the surgeries that would include firstly, vaginal hysterectomy, secondly, anterior colporaphy, and thirdly, posterior colporaphy. So without wasting any more time, we present to you Dr. Douglas Miyazaki. Okay. These are our disclosures. I'm founder and president of Miyazaki Enterprises and speaker and consultant for Coloplast Surgical. Noah Miyazaki is vice president of Miyazaki Enterprises. A bit about our background first. I've been fortunate to have trained in medical school and OB-GYN residency training at Wake Forest University and then went into private practice in town. I've been a clinical faculty since 1994 and I have responsibilities of training the residents as well. And I've noticed a significant decline uh, in the skill level of residents over the last two decades. And largely, this is due to less cases. So I actually tracked this compared to my experience as a graduating resident and found that the current national average performs 85% less vaginal hysterectomies than when I graduated. This is an alarming statistic for us, and our United States Accreditation Council on Graduate Medical Education launched the Milestone Project in 2008 due to patient safety concerns with the skill levels declining. The milestones are how we grade each resident at every level of training and they're expected to be able to perform competently certain basic tasks and skill sets in the surgical arena. This further led my inspiration to develop and research over the past 12 years, the MIA model. And the main focus was on realistic surgical skills training and demonstration of competency before the resident and fellow hits the OR. Therefore, no harm can come to our patients while they're training basic tasks and skill sets. The MIA model is able to perform basically every vaginal procedure we do in gynecology. 
from basic office procedures like GYN exam, office endometrial biopsy, urethral bladder catheterization, IUD placement, as well as other basic surgical procedures such as dilation curatage, diagnostic and operative hysteroscopy, and other further and more advanced gynecologic procedures such as vaginal hysterectomy, sling placements, full thickness vaginal wall dissection out laterally to the arcus, anterior posterior coporophy, copoclysis, and bilateral sacral spinous ligament suspension. The focus of the MIA model has been on developing realistic tissue haptics. Most of the parts are made from a medical grade silicon. They're designed to mimic real tissue cutting, suturing, and feel. The bony pelvis is anatomically correct, and the soft structure shown here is the large uterus with the open cervical os and a hollow endometrial cavity for our hysteroscopies. The yellow bladder has a one-way valve. At the base of the bladder is a raised trigonal ridge with two little shallow dimples which will simulate the ureteral orifice. The red structure at the bottom of the screen is the placeholder for the perineal body. We'll eventually develop models for third and fourth degree perineal laceration. Shown here is the sacrospinous ligament. This is fixed in place so you can do bidirectional forces on the sacrospinous ligament. There are approaches from beneath the sacrospinous ligament for support as well as the current top-down approach. This is our high fidelity uterus and vagina. This has multiple layers and a fascia within the broad ligament, which will also simulate your uterosacral ligaments. These are the obturator membranes. There's a right and left, and they are also transfixed for bidirectional force vectors, so you can do inside out or an outside in sling approach. There's three different layers to mimic the actual pop and feel of trocar passage. Shown here are our newer, less expensive, lower fidelity vagina and uteri. These were designed specifically for high repetition vaginal hysterectomy training. And last is the vulva, which is all medical grade silicon. The medical grade silicon has a lot of memory to it and withstands multiple puncture sites and cutting and tearing before it has to be replaced. We have been performing live simulation training for the last five years, and these are some of our tips that we have learned through experience. The first is KISS. Just keep it simple. Secondly, clearly define the target audience. Are you training residents, fellows, clinical faculty, and also know the skill level of each level of trainee. Define your simulation goals. Is this an introduction to new technique or product demonstration? Is this a training for improving technique? Or are you just highlighting a few key steps of the procedure? Or are you demonstrating the entire procedure? Also, is this a competency assessment? If so, are you going to use low fidelity or high fidelity models? We would also like to introduce the Toby Pro eye tracking system. The eye tracking device consists of an empty eyeglass frame, which has a camera which focuses on each eye, and no personal biometrics are able to be recorded. There's a center mounted camera in the mid portion of the eyeglass. The eye tracking system is able to measure and track all eye movements, and it can record the time it takes from one focus to another focus. So you're able to really understand where the surgeon is looking and it gives you a much better idea of what they're thinking if you're able to see what they're seeing through their eyes. It is also important to understand education styles. Different simulations and learning adventures require different types of learning. Is this a self-directed learning event? where residents and learners can use videos and didactics to walk through procedures on their own? 
Is this an attending directed or proctored learning? Or is this an expert demonstration where the expert can demonstrate the procedure on a model and then broadcast to an audience live or via Zoom later? Is this a learner evaluation where the learner performs the procedure on the model while being recorded with live proctor? Or is this a learner evaluation where the learner is able to perform a procedure which will be recorded and then evaluated? Or is this learner-directed teaching? So in our simulation, we do train the trainer, which helps give young faculty experience and education with how to train a surgical technique. With the MIA model, we want to develop something more than just a task trainer. So we've been able to develop an entire surgical training ecosystem around vaginal surgery. This includes surgical skill training, surgical curriculum, video tutorials, as well as a surgical competency assessment. We have developed a free instructional app called the MIA app, which is available on Apple products and also will soon be available on Android platform as well. Our education modules have all been published in the American College of OB-GYN website. And I'm also a member of the American College of OB-GYN Simulation Working Group. Our research has been funded by the National Institute of Health, the Eunice Kennedy Shriver Branch of Child Health and Human Development. We have been blessed to receive five NIH awards or grants thus far. The first two of these listed were designed around development and validation of the MIA model to train vaginal surgery techniques. This was a phase one and phase two study. We also received a grant to further help develop and commercialize different products of the MIA model. In addition to vaginal hysterectomy training, we received a phase one grant to evaluate the similar for gynecologic sling surgery techniques. These NIH activities had led to two publications of our phase one vaginal hysterectomy study, which was published in the International Urogynecology Association Journal in 2018. And we were able to demonstrate that the MIA model is a useful teaching and a tool for assessing vaginal surgery skills regarding hysterectomy. Our phase two study was also recently published in this month's Green Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. This was significant because we were able to demonstrate validity using the MIA model for vaginal hysterectomy training and validate the vaginal surgery skills index. And we actually were able to come up with a pass-fail cutoff score as far as competency assessment. These studies and publications have led to our most recent award, which was announced two months ago. This will be a three-year longitudinal study comparing a cohort of simulation-trained residents on vaginal hysterectomy using the MIA model and also comparing them to a control, traditionally trained group who will film their first live case using the Toby eye tracking glasses and compare the study results. We'll begin the study in 2021. So I'd like to pause there a moment and see if there's any questions about some of our, our research activities that we've done. And I would also like to uh, show that these are the Toby eye tracking glasses here. It's just an empty glass frame. You can see you can go through. And there's a camera in the center mount and there's one small camera on each corneal lens, uh, on each lens here, which focuses on your cornea. This has been used widely in sports such as golf, tennis, uh, activities like that. Uh, in this way, I think we'll be able to gain a lot of expert information about knowing what the surgeon is thinking if we can see where they're looking at, especially with vaginal surgery. Um, the field, surgical field is very small. It's very difficult to 
get them to understand the anatomic relationships, the proper tissue planes. But if you can see what they're doing through their eyes, I think that will greatly help shorten the learning curve and increase the efficiency of how we teach. Um, and so that would be part of our new study. If there are no questions, we'll uh, cut back to the, uh, uh, the next, the vaginal hysterectomy. An examination under anesthesia is mandatory before the surgery. It helps to assess the vagina and any pathology, the amount of prolapse. It verifies the size, shape, and mobility of the uterus and rechecks for unsuspected pelvic or ovarian masses. Do a rectal examination to again check for masses and cul-de-sac nodularity, and also to clean stool from the lower colon. The MIA model is designed to simulate the entire vaginal hysterectomy procedure. An exam is performed first to assess uterine size and mobility, and the anterior and posterior cul-de-sacs are palpated. As the vagina is dissected posteriorly, the peritoneum comes into view. A male scissor can be used to enter the posterior cul-de-sac into the peritoneal cavity. Explore this with your finger to make sure that you are not in the rectum and that there are no masses in the cul-de-sac. The vaginal mucosa over the posterior cul-de-sac is tented and incised with sharp dissection. The scissor tips are kept in a perpendicular orientation to the uterocervical axis. After you have dissected the bladder off of the cervix using sharp and blunt dissection, attempt to visualize the lower edge of the peritoneum separate from the bladder. After you see the lower edge of the peritoneum, lift up one of the layers of the peritoneum and make a sharp, small incision into the peritoneal cavity. Place your finger into the peritoneal cavity to make sure that it is not the bladder and to further explore for masses and the size of the uterus as you did posteriorly. Place a right angle retractor into this incision over your finger. The bladder is sharply dissected free and protected. The scissor tips are kept in a parallel orientation to the uterocervical axis and the peritoneum is entered sharply. So I would like to uh, point out that there's a couple of very important uh, points here. One, uh, I don't know if the audience was able to notice that the cervical is very elongated. Typically that means your bladder and your uh, peritoneal cavities are going to be a little bit higher up onto the cervix uh, and, and lower segment of the uterus, especially the bladder. So that means we need to be a little bit more patient before you're entering into the anterior pelvic cavity. We use surgery lube on the front and back sides of the uterus. And when you do your exam, you can actually feel the slipperiness of the peritoneum. And that also gives you a clue okay, the cul-de-sac should be around here. Um, and then, again, as mentioned in the video, the angle of the scissor tips, I think, is very important. You don't want to be too much of an angle um, on the anterior dissection. It's going to be more of a 20 to 30 degrees. Otherwise, commonly, the residents uh, will start digging into the cervix, and it creates a lot of excess bleeding. And then the underneath the bladder and anterior pelvic cavity. And it creates a lot more difficult dissection because then you have to come back up, but then you don't know exactly where you are. And then um, you're more likely to create small nicks in the bladder. The posterior pelvic cavity, I think the exam under anesthesia is the best thing. With the rectal exam, I do on everybody personally to check for cul-de-sac nodularity first. Um, rarely, especially with prolapse surgery, 
are you going to have an obliterated cul-de-sac? Uh, but there have been one or two cases where there has been pathology. And so I did my approach a different way and was just a lot more patient until I was sure I was away from any pathology. After the posterior peritoneum and cul-de-sac is entered, the hysterectomy is begun by transecting the uterosacral ligaments bilaterally. I use a curved Haney clamp and carefully place it into the posterior peritoneum and then slide it over the anterior part of the uterosacral ligament. This allows transection of the uterosacral ligament close to the uterus in the peritoneal cavity. I then suture ligate the pedicle using a Haney stitch and hold it for later identification of the uterosacral ligaments. Traction on the cervix helps with proper clamp placement around the entire uterosacral ligament. Cutting against the clamp decreases tissue necrosis. A Haney stitch is shown here, and this is tagged for use with the vaginal cuff closure or McCall's caldoplasty. Once the peritoneum is entered both posteriorly and anteriorly and retractors are placed, and after the uterosacral ligaments are both transected, examine for the position of the uterine vessels. I usually use the clamp, cut, and tie technique for the uterine vessels, but vessel sealing devices work well too. I singly clamp the uterine arteries close to the cervix with a curved Haney clamp and use Haney transfixion sutures to ligate the pedicles. Some surgeons doubly clamp the uterine arteries and this is reasonable as well. It is important for the clamp to slide off the uterus and stay inside the uterosacral pedicle. Assistance can be shown how to maneuver the clamp for proper knot placement at the heel of the clamp to ensure there's no soft tissue between the clamp and uterosacral pedicle. If the pedicle is not tied well, the vascular system will bleed. So these are uh, very uh, good points to remember. And the other guest speaker on the video is the uh, one and only Dr. Mark Walters. Uh, he was very gracious and shared his step-by-step -step live vaginal hysterectomy video with me when we were putting this project together. Uh, if you noticed, um, he isolates the uterocycle ligament as a separate tissue clamp, as well as the vascular pedicle. Uh, we purposefully do this uh, so one, we can attach the uterocycle ligament to the vaginal cuff that helps with your suspensions after the procedure is completed. Uh, isolating the pedicle itself is very helpful. And he discussed either doubly clamping it, which is fine, singly clamping it, or using vessel sealing devices. So I've actually started to adopt it using the Ligasure uh, bipolar vessel sealing device. It costs about $1,100 in our OR. But if I'm doing a vaginal hysterectomy, anterior pair, posterior pair, sling, and apical suspension of some type, and I can cut off 30 minutes of a clamp cut and tie uh, with the ligature device or energy device, uh, I think it really justifies the cost. Uh, it certainly minimizes bleeding greatly, and that's really important also I keep in mind who my assistant is. Do I have a second year resident, first year resident, or is it the chief? But then again, knowing the teaching strategy, you have to know the skill level of who you're working with. So certain times we'll do certain things, um, but on long cases, I think the vessel sealing devices do have a, a distinct advantage from 
it costs savings, uh, less blood loss as well. The ureters can be palpated at 2 and 10 o'clock against a curved Diva retractor and are protected with traction on the cervix and retraction of the bladder with the Diva. Different uterine morselation techniques can be practiced such as bivalve and wedge resection. Seen here is the walking technique for delivering the larger uterine fundus. Keep in mind, uterine morselation should only be done after entry into the anterior and posterior pelvic cavity has been accomplished and the vascular pedicle secured. As shown here, the fundus can only be popped out after complete ligation and transection of the upper pedicles. For larger pedicles or in anticipation of removing the ovaries, the round ligament may be taken as a separate bite. After both uterine vessels are transected and the uterus is mobile enough to be delivered posteriorly, curved haney clamps are used to clamp the utero ovarian pedicle. I usually double clamp this pedicle to help with bleeding, but it is certainly reasonable to singly clamp the pedicle as well. Since I have two clamps on the pedicle, I place a free tie first. This helps to decrease the chance of a hematoma formation when I place my transfixion suture. I then place a second transfixion suture and hold this for later identification of all of the pedicles of the vaginal hysterectomy on that side. The uterovarian ligament is clamped across, and as you can see, the open-ended torso has a distinct teaching advantage for difficult clamp placement. A tie on a right angle clamp is shown here. Other options are endo loops and vessel sealing devices. A modified McCall's cotoplasty is demonstrated. The suture first goes through the vaginal mucosa. It incorporates both uterocycle ligaments and posterior peritoneum. And then exits back through the vaginal mucosa. I just wanted to uh, stop there and uh, also make uh, some uh, points about uh, getting the adnex out, uh, especially the tubes. Uh, United States, this is pretty much standard of care to help reduce the risks of ovarian cancer in the future. Uh, if we know that it had a large uterus, fibroids, maybe some previous surgeries, endometriosis, uh, the tubes may be scarred. Separately taking down the round ligament purposefully will greatly, greatly help get the tubes and ovaries out safely. Sometimes if the pedicles are very high, we've been in where they're almost as long or longer as the physical clamp and you really can't reach it. Well, then you have to figure out how am I going to be able to walk the pedicle down to me? You're much less likely to tear the vascular, vascular supply if you've taken down the round ligament as a separate purposeful bite. And then you will be able to gently tease this into your field. You can put a clamp on. And for these high pedicles, uh, I will use an endo loop and tie down to the pedicle. 
or rather tie up to the pedicle. So you're not pulling it down, trying to cinch your knot in because that can frequently tear and there, then you'll have a delayed bleeding later. So if you know you want to get the adnexa, purposefully look for the round ligament and take that as a separate bite and then just gently tease the tube and over into your field and then clamp, tie in a passer or end a loop are great options. Uh, there's some things you can do like V-notes, which is the vaginal laparoscopic approach for more difficult cases. Uh, this is used mostly to look inside the posterior cul-de-sac cul with the laparoscope to see what the pathology is before you start your vag shift, or you can convert to lap hiss, robotic, or, or open if it's very, very bad. The uterocycle ligaments should be incorporated into the vaginal cuff closure and full thickness bites, including the posterior peritoneum, are recommended. The corners are sutured in a figure of eight fashion and the remaining vaginal wall closed with the running lock or figure of eight stitches of absorbable suture. The MIA model provides a realistic surgical experience not available until now. Surgeons can practice, build their muscle memory, increase their skill and confidence without any risk to our patients. The anatomy is constant, so it can be used as an objective standard for assessing skill and competency. The ACOG Simulation Consortium has developed a vaginal hysterectomy assessment tool, and each of the clinical performance tasks can be measured with the MIA model vaginal surgery simulator. Thank you for the honor of showing this video. Okay, so thank you for uh, watching the vaginal hysterectomy simulation video. Uh, I think there's lots of key points. Are, are we at a time to take questions from the audience? So uh, Dr. Miyazaki, it was a lovely presentation. And I appreciate the um, worth you have taken, the time and efforts you have taken to teach residents and the generation next. Actually, that's our goal. Because as you feel, I also totally feel that this is something that art is dying, okay? Then um, we have to really rejuvenate and take this effort because I feel even for prolapsed uterus or not for not prolapsed uterus also, it is a very effective and very good technique of um, a vaginal hysterectomy, which we can do in non-prolapse uterus also. So um, today for this discussion, it is not a pre-decided panel discussion kind of thing, but whosoever was logged in, we took them for their opinion, because this is something that all surgeons are doing. There is nothing like these are not um, very once in a while kind of procedure, vaginal hysterectomy, every gynecologist does. So we are taking uh, in panel with us, we have uh, Dr. Heb Shripad Hebbar, all of you have met him yesterday, and uh, Dr. Priya Bellal. Both of us are joining us. Uh, so my thing is, um, like uh, everybody is, um, if we have any questions from audience, that also we would like to take. But actually, I was really, um, when you told me a few months ago about the Toby tracking device, I was not very sure what this device is. I tried to Google it. But um, I'm very impressed that it can see the surgeon's eye movement and can pick up. Yeah, if you can explain a little bit more, that will be really helpful because I tried to Google it that time when you have discussed with me, but to tell you the truth, okay. These are actually the eye tracking glasses I have on currently. Uh -huh. Zoom in a little bit more. There is a camera right in the center mount, yes. a tiny camera here, another mm -hmm. tiny camera here, that looks at each eye. Okay. And so when you look left, right, up or down, mm -hmm. your eyes follow and we have bi binocular vision. Mm -hmm. So the center mount will focus on whatever you're looking at okay. and you can program it. So there's actually a red line from here. Okay. And then I look over here 
-hmm. And then you can see the red line trace and it will actually measure the timestamp of how long it took to go from, this is backwards, this corner to this corner and then back to the middle. And so it can track all those movements. That's and as we know with laparoscopy, we can see the field, but you still have no idea where your assistant is looking or your cameraman is looking. You're going, no, I, I want the patient's right pelvic side wall, not the left. And it's, so it's another way of looking inside the mind of the assistant or the surgeon. You know, if we can know what they're thinking a little bit more clearly, I think teaching will be more efficient since everything in the United States is very cost sensitive, time in the OR, not to mention our patients. Really, it if it takes an hour longer to teach them the same principle that they could have learned in the sim lab, that's a lot of extra anesthesia time. Our, a lot of our patients are older and there's infections, et cetera. And the long, we all know the longer the cases, the more likely there are to have complications and worse outcomes. So I think it helps will really facilitate a whole new level of, of learning and training and how we teach people too. Uh, so Hibarsa, would you like to ask any question after this surgery, after vaginal hysterectomy? It was a very, really impressive model. I thought uh, like would have, our students would have been definited. Definitely, they would have been benefited that if they had come here with the model. I think that the Deepsha definitely is going for his uh, uh, one day, you know, next few next, uh, next, next year. So please bring him uh, to our uh, center and uh, demonstrate the techniques of our uh, junior residents. Uh, I just wanted to know, like, uh, if the this so-called model, is it possible to do infiltration? Because yeah. can you yeah. do vaginal hysterectomy, we develop the same with the technique what is called as hydro dissection. Basically, like we inject either saline or saline with uh, adrenaline into the tissue planes uh, with the two advantages. One, it delineates the planes and secondly, it reduces the amount of bleeding. So uh, does this uh, model, they have what is called as uh, uh, different layers and uh, we can infiltrate some amount of like distilled water in between the planes. Am I audible? Yes. Uh, are you asking if we're able to inject water into different tissue planes? Uh, our, the medical grade silicon uh, has memory. So when you inject the water into the plane, it actually squirts it back out at you, <laughs> but you can see a nice bleb. So we use um, air and to make sure you can just get the needle in the correct plane. Uh, and we'll actually demonstrate that uh, on the anterior coporophy uh, video. Um, certain things, the bladder does hold about 75 cc's of water. We have a cork on the top of it. So you can actually do diagnostic cystoscopy, retrieve the pathology through the uh, urethral valve. Uh, again, we have two little dimples to uh, mimic the ureter orifice. So you can actually probe and practice ureteral catheterizations. Uh, we have a one-way valve on the bladder to help hold the urine in. And then that also teaches um, uh, student nurses how to, how to do in and out cath. Uh, so we have other uh, fluid-filled modalities that we can do. Um, you could tie the rectum off and fill the rectum with fluid. And uh, you can actually add like different layers of silicon glue and then obliterate the cul-de-sac on purpose and see if they're able to dissect through or not. Um, and then our uh, uteri, two of our models have a live vascular feed to it. And it's basically standard IV tubing um, and it mimics the uterine artery pathway. And so you actually have to clamp, cut and tie each pedicle because we glue them very close to the uterine body. And uh, that way people have to actively practice every single time in the clamp, how to tie a knot, how to lay the knot down. And also equally as important, the assistant learns how to release the clamp. Sometimes the newer assistants, they'll just release the clamp really fast and you don't have time to slide your knot down. So this actually will teach the assistants how to uh, release the clamp properly, slowly, and you want to release that clamp in the exact same way it was placed to keep the knot more perpendicular to the tissue plane. And that helps prevent the tissue from slipping out since we typically have the uterus on a lot of traction. So all those little things 
are the deeper dive of learning and being a good assistant and uh, cutting that learning curve short. Uh, second question to you is, uh, like, does the model has really bleeding uterine arteries? Like, let us say, like, by accidentally, like, we uh, clamp the screws, and does the pedicle uh, starts oozing? Like, do you, I mean, are you making uh, any idea to prepare such models? So we actually um, use um, uh, food coloring that's kid safety, so it washes out of clothing. And since it's at standard IV tubing, uh, we actually have IV tubing that hooks up. Uh, and I just get all the sterile IV fluid bags from the hospital because they're free. They throw them away. And I take the sterile tubing uh, and then I wrap a blood pressure cuff around the IV bag. And I could pump it up to 80 millimeters, whatever. Uh, and it keeps a steady 80 millimeters of pressure on the patient the whole time. So much like real life, if you have uh, knots that are not really secured tightly with traction and tugging and pulling on the pedicles, the knots will loosen um, or as tissues necrose a day later, if they're not really secure, you'll get delayed bleeding. Uh, and so the vascular system will bleed um, actively. And uh, we noticed a huge difference when we have just regular clear water in the tubing versus colored water. People were sweating um, as far as the chiefs when they're doing our learning and because uh, they know their patient's bleeding to death. <laughs> and we've had them drain out a whole liter and it's just a big mess on the ground, but we use towels and it's all washable, so it's fine. But the goal is, you know, find the bleeding and stop it. <laughs> when, when we were exploring the model here, actually I did not know that this feature is there in your model. And when me and Sovriti the first day were seeing the model, we were so impressed that actually like you try an artery, Hebarsa, there are tubings. Then we saw the video and we came to know that actually you can measure the blood loss. So that is one feature. I really loved it because exactly at the site of uterine artery, there are tubings which can be attached to some food color or whatever you are, even saline, you can measure it. So I feel that that was a, for beginners, that was a very uh, important uh, feature you had given Dr. Douglas. Like you have been very thoughtful in that what problems, what things can be there, which people want to learn. There is a question for from the audience. It is uh, our Dr. Jairam Nambiar from Manipal. He has asked one question. Let me read it out for you. He is saying that what is your preferred mode of approach in cases of previous cesarean section with adhesions? Yeah. So we know that uh, having a single C-section is not a contraindication to vaginal hysterectomy. Uh, so it really depends upon the exam. Um, and in the office, it's very difficult to uh, do a proper exam to um, feel adhesions just because of discomfort of tugging and pulling on the um, cervix. Uh, so many times I'll actually schedule it as a possible laparoscopic hyst uh, hysterectomy versus vaginal. Um, one of my colleagues in, uh, in our town is uh, pioneering the V-notes. That's the uh, vaginal laparoscopic approach. I personally have not done that yet, but I think the number of cases you would wanna do that is probably a small number. I am pretty religious about reading the operative notes. Um, and we have electronic medical records, so everybody tends to copy and paste the op note. <laughs> But if they were detailed in their description of the details of surgery, were all the adhesions taken down, or they're freed in order to get the baby out. Um, so I look at those factors, but if I'm just not sure, then I'll post it as a possible vaginal hysterectomy, possible operative lap uh, laparoscopic hysterectomy. Okay. So if any other question is there from Dr. Priya Balal, Dr. Shripit Hibbar, sir, if you want to ask anything, uh, uh, would you like to say anything, Dr. Priya, ma'am? Um, thank you for inviting me on this panel. I'm very sorry. Uh, I'm not prepared and I'm very casually sitting around on Sunday okay. afternoon. Okay. That's, what we want. That's what we want. That's what we want. But it was a casual family discussion. That's it. It Nothing. was... Uh, Lovely, Dr. Miyagi. I think a lot of detailing. And uh, for some reason, I'm very, very reassured today. I'll tell you why. 
every time I have to assist a new uh, resident for the first vaginal hysterectomy, it's always very, very nervous and tensing because like Dr. Miyagi explained, I cannot see what the, uh, the, you know, the junior doctor is actually doing. And we're worried whether the knots are tight enough and actually getting them to work on a live patient is very, very, um, very difficult. So this simulator, I think, is going to uh, ease our tensions a lot. And uh, it's something that I think every, um, every uh, training center should have. And I congratulate Dr. Miyagi on a wonderful, uh, wonderful training model. Thank you. Uh, so, Hebar, sir, um, if everybody is okay, can we go to the next surgery? That is, uh, I hope, Anthea Kolpur, Ravi. Yes, and I think um, I'll do one follow-up on the um, obliterated cul-de-sac comment. Okay. okay. Uh, if I'm going to approach that vaginally, I will be twice or three times as patient getting into the cul-de-sacs. So I'll wait, wait, dissect. Uh, rectal exam concomitantly will very be very helpful. And then when I can actually feel the cul-de-sac between my fingers, that's when I'll actually make my sharp entry posteriorly. And then I can feel and I have a lot better idea of really what's going on with the rest of the case above. So I just have to tell myself, be patient, be patient. When I can 100% identify the cul-de-sac, that's when I would make my entry. But I still think it's very reasonable to start vaginally. Dr. Diksha? Yes, sir. Uh, he said uh, he has some tool called a vaginal assessment tool for postgraduates. Yes, sir. Uh, like, uh, can you just uh, share with us, or you can just let us know, like, what exactly, like, uh, the tool does? Uh, so actually, the same thing he showed in the beginning that Mia model. We have it right now with us. If you um, want to see it, I'll just put my camera if it can capture, and I'll show you. That is the Mia model. Can you see it here? Lying inside this box. We have this model. Okay, and we can use it anytime, whenever anybody feels like. Actually, the plan was that we'll have a live workshop here, and he will get two to three models with him from US. And we, one model we were already having. So the initial plan was that we'll have three to four stations here today. And then uh, we can have four or five students who can learn. Uh, but um, it did not happen. But anyway, <laughs> this is not the end of the life. It will happen someday, I'm sure. Yeah, and the assessment tool is published. Uh, Grace Chen spearheaded that project from Cleveland Clinic. Uh, currently, uh, our milestones that I alerted to at the beginning of the video, that's called the global rating system. And there's basically seven metrics that they look at, use of assistance, uh, basic core um, competencies, and the Vagile Surgery Skills Index has about 11 of these core competencies. So it's a little bit more detailed uh, and it's a little bit more tailored towards vaginal surgery versus I'm doing a re colon resection, did I know what I'm doing kind of thing. And so that's the skills index that we used. Uh, and then you can actually create numerical scores. And so with our last study that's published this month in our green journal, we were able to show for the vaginal hysterectomy, if you had a vaginal surgery skills index score of less than 27, 85% of the time, that's a fail. So you should not go to the OR as a primary surgeon. And so that's the goal of our next study, which will be a three-year longitudinal study. We're gonna have a simulation-based trained group where they all score uh, above a 27 times two, and that will give them a basic competency. And then we'll let them uh, do their first vaginal hiss uh, with the eye tracking glasses on. And then compare that to a traditional trained arm, which has just normal simulation, whatever the normal simulation program is, some or none. Um, and then film their first live case also. And that will be kind of a, a new landmark study doing actual simulation vaginal training formally where you can score them and grade them versus our traditional C1, do one, teach one training. So can we uh, go ahead with the next surgery, please? Yes, and here we go. Ronak, 